So we're going live in a minute. Well, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Efe Yukala, and I'm the founder of Impact Her, an impact-driven organization that helps um, African female entrepreneurs scale their businesses and get access to investors. Um, this afternoon, we will be talking about um, delving into the limits on um, freedom of speech and expression and how it impacts um, what we do um, globally um, and also how it helps shape you know, the current societal fabric. Um, with me today, I have Fabrice, who would introduce himself, and I also have Sarah. Um, happy to be here with them today. So I will turn over to Fabrice to introduce himself. Well, thank you so much for moderating this session, Efe. Uh, I, I, I'm really flattered that uh, that I'm I'm, uh, I'm part of it. Uh, I, you know, as I was telling you, I'm a bit of a one-trick pony. Uh, you know, I work at the World Bank, and towards the end of my time at the World Bank, I work a lot on LGBTQ issues. Then I went to work for the uh, High Commissioner on Human Rights at the United Nations, again on LGBTQ issues. And now um, I work at Out Leadership, a think tank in New York, on LGBT issues. Now, this being said, LGBTQ plus people are always thought about as people that now are actually kind of fighting freedom of speech, uh, particularly in the United States and, and in Canada. And so I find myself at the center of this free speech debate. So I, that's the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be part of your panel today. Oh, that's that's fantastic, and I I, I think we're gonna delve in and, and really understand later how you know this really impacts um, the way people are able to live, right? So I think I would be curious to hear your thoughts more on that. And I'll turn over to Sarah now. Hopefully, we can hear her now. How are we doing? Can you hear me? Perfect, okay. perfect. Okay. It was funny um, I was the one who had the issue at first. <laughs> it's all good. It's the technology is. If we can handle the tech, we can handle everything else, right? Um, mm -hmm. Fabrice, if it's really nice to meet you guys. It's lovely to have a chance to talk about this stuff with you guys. Um, I am, uh, compared to the two of you, radically underqualified to open my mouth in the next 45 minutes. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm an actor, I'm a director, I'm a writer, uh, and I think about these issues a lot in terms of the social media space and the ways in which um, especially as somebody who uh, lives between the U.S. and Canada, issues of free speech, I think, are in some ways, they feel like they're a little bit more on the top, on the chopping block than they've been in a long time. And um, it seems as though, you know, taking a bit of a step back and looking at a, at a broader historical context rather than just the events of the last few months and years in the States might give us a, a bit more of a sense of uh, how to look at these kind of issues. Um, and Fabrice, I'm also the mother of a 13 year old trans son. So I wanna thank you for the work that you're doing on inclusion worldwide, because uh, you know my boys gotta grow up and walk in the world in a safe and inclusive way. And I'm very grateful for your work. No, that that's amazing. And thank you so much. And I think that it's, it's actually interesting having you on this panel because the different perceptions, right, always come into play. So mm -hmm. that's why the fact that you, you know, play a huge role in the creative space. You know, I would also be curious to hear how the freedom of speech impacts what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and how mm -hmm. are you using speech to highlight issues, right, your creativity, the creative and runner to highlight mm -hmm. issues that are ongoing in society. So we would be curious to hear about that. So I don't know <laughs> that you are super underqualified to be here today. Um, but thank you so much. So we will turn to, I would. this question is actually um, poised um, to the both of you, which is what does freedom of expression or speech, what does that really mean to you? Obviously against the backdrop of, you know, what you work on every day, what you see every day. Well, uh, you know, if you don't mind, I'll, 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 I'll take it up first. As, you know, for me, it's, it's a complex issue because on one hand, you know, we see the resurgence of hate speech against LGBTQ plus people. You know, as a mother of a, of a trans uh, a child, you must be horrified by what people have been saying about trans people in the context of, you know, this anti-trans 
sports bill or the anti-trans, uh, uh, you know, young people uh, transitioning uh, bills in the U.S., there has been a lot of hateful rhetoric. And so on one hand, we are horrified by that. But then on the other hand, I look at China, I look at Russia, I look at Singapore, in which the, the lack of freedom of speech is what is frustrating progress on LGBTQ issues. And so in a way, I think LGBTQ plus people sometimes are tempted to be part of the movement that is trying to restrain speech we do not like. Uh, and in particular, anti-LGBTQ speech. But I think we have to refrain from uh, stopping free speech because we are suffering from the lack of freedom of expression in most parts of the world. And when you live in the United States, when you live in Canada, and I love what you said, right? If you don't look at the history, you just look at what's happening now, it can be tempting to say, well, I don't want that person to be able to come and express themselves in my university because I disagree with what they say or because what they say is too awful to be heard. But I think we have to remember that freedom of speech is in fact playing on, in our favor. And so, you know, I find, to, to answer your question, if I find myself very often in the middle of that debate, no, and, and I think you mentioned a couple of things that I want to come back to you on because you talked about, you know, obviously where the limitations could, 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 could cause, you know, a hindrance. But I think a follow up to that would be, are there scenarios where those limitations are actually for the greater good? So we would, we would come back to that because you sort of touched upon it, but I, I would want to see how you would delve deeper into that. Um, at this point, I'll turn to Sarah to hear her thoughts from her creative perspective, the creative industry's perspective. Well, I, I, Fabrice, I really appreciate what you have to say on that too, because I, I very much agree that uh, limiting speech against any one group, no matter how hateful, does open the door for for anyone's speech to be limited. Um, I, you know, creatively, I just heard a really interesting uh, podcast. Rebecca Carroll has a podcast called Come Through, and she just interviewed um, uh, Walter Mosley um, about an op-ed that he'd written. I think it was in the New York Times after he quit a writer's room uh, as a black writer when he used the N-word in a story he was telling about racism and somebody complained about the context of that story. And I think in the creative side, you know, it's, it's those, it's that language that's so dangerous, right? Because as creative people, we need to be able to live in a dangerous space so that we can tell stories that push the envelope. But we also need to feel sufficiently respected within that space that we can speak. Um, and Walter Mosley came down completely on the side of free speech. He said, whether somebody says something that offends me, that hurts me, that shows me that they're a terrible person I want nothing to do with is one thing. The speech has to be free because eventually oppressed people need to be able to raise their voices. And I think that's the side I come down on too. The place where I have a little bit of a question mark when it comes to the, the public sector and government is schools. And I do feel, I do feel that children ought to be provided an opportunity to learn in an environment free of attacks on their identity. Um, and if somebody used hate speech towards a child in a school, I think I would be pretty comfortable with that child being sanctioned with the, the person who used that being sanctioned. I, so that, that's the only place to me that I feel it's a, it's a public space, but it involves children. That's the question mark for me on limits. Yeah. And you know, and I love, I love that. I think that that's actually, it kind of comes down to the crux of the matter, which is there should not be a threat of violence for sure. Right? That, that should not right. be covered by freedom of speech. And then there should be a freedom from harassment. You know, because indeed, if a student is in school and is facing harassment, basically it kind of hinders his right to education. 
Um, and you know what is interesting is that the ACLU, uh, which by the way finds itself also, you know, right at the intersection of those of those two uh, of those two movements, the freedom of speech movement and also the anti hate speech movement, you know, they kind of they kind of articulated what is acceptable, right? Which is that a student, as an example, coming back. I told you I'm a one trick pony. So coming back <laughs> of LGBTQ issue, you know, a student should be able to say that he opposes civil liberties for LGBTQ plus people in the classroom, provided it's on a discussion on that topic, right? He should be able to express his opinion that LGBTQ people, as an example, should not participate participate in sport, right? That trans youth should not participate in sport. Mm -hmm. But that student should only be allowed to do it in a way that is not harassing a specific student and that is not threatening to a spe specific student. And you know, and it's very difficult to accept because to be honest, I don't want your son to have, to hear one of his comrades say, you should not be allowed to, to participate in sport. Right. But I think that unfortunately, that's a sacrifice we have to make to the freedom of speech. And in a way, maybe as a mother, you can explain to the son, listen, you are going to be faced with opinions that are not valid and opinions that are hateful. But sure. the reason why we accommodate that space is because we believe that freedom of speech is the bedrock of our society. And that same freedom of speech protects my son when he shows up with a pride flag on his back and somebody says, well, I don't want you to wear that. He says, well, okay, but I have the right, you know, I mean, as long as the freedom of speech is applied equally by mm -hmm. the administrating bodies there, you know, if they're, if they're opening, if they're hiding uh, a countenance of hate speech and silencing the other side of it, obviously that's problematic. But as long as freedom of speech is something that is fully enshrined, then you've got the right behind you. I mean, I think what, what I see as having become deeply problematic, at least in North America lately, is uh, our inability to tell the truth from fiction, right? This, this whole fake news, <laughs> they made it up. I'm just going to say that the election was stolen. And the, you know what I mean? Like that kind of thing is, Bizarre, and I think in some ways we're all feeling a little bit like we're living in the twilight zone, where you have to continually create factual information rather than being moving on, being able to move on to other things. And so I think it does seem to me that it falls a little bit on the private sector, and particularly from my perspective, social media companies, to start to sift through some of this, right? Which is to say, freedom of speech means you can say whatever you want, but it doesn't make what you say true. It just means you can say it. And so what are the mechanisms that we can put in place? And, you know, we can talk about this in a little bit and I've got some ideas, but mechanisms so that when somebody says something outrageous and posits it as the facts, there is, there is a mechanism in place for some, for there to be, you know, verification the way you'd have with a peer reviewed journal or a, you know, scientific peer review study to say, you're welcome to say that. It isn't true, but you're welcome to say it. You know, you oh. know I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you also, you know, I was trying to think a little bit about the issue this morning before our discussion. And one of the things that I was thinking too is that, is that sometimes we forget also that this very unpleasant exchange of ideas and sometimes even the lies is the process through which we come to a positive consensus. Sure. And we come to the truth, meaning that, you know, this morning I was moderating a, a panel on Japan uh, because we are celebrating pride. And so I was talking, I had a panel on marriage equality in Japan. And, and last week, there is a politician of the ruling party that says something very offensive about LGBTQ plus people. He said, you know, he said uh, that we were a threat to the reproduction of the species. Uh, Congratulations. Which, That's a lot of power. And you know, in Japan, it's a, in Japan, it's a very controversial idea, you know, because as you know, the population is going down. 
Uh, now I'll tell you I'm a gay man. I'm a single gay man and I have two children. So I have done my part in... Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, so of course I don't like that. And last week I, I published a little piece in which I was saying, you know, how oh, it is disappointing that the ruling party has not passed an anti-discrimination law. But this morning, you know, in preparation of this panel, I was thinking the fact that there is a dialogue in Japan around LGBT issues is a sign of progress. And sometimes the fact that someone says something as hateful as that uh, uh, political leader did can also be a little bit the, the turning point, you know, the, the wake-up call for the majority that, well, maybe it's time in Japan for marriage equality and an anti-discrimination act. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I don't know if you agree with me, but, but, but that, you know, we, we should not forget that dissent and lies are unfortunately part of the process sometimes. Yeah, no, I, I think that, that you make a great point there. So, you know, in a way, as people are free to express, you know, both sides of their own coin, it possibly brings more awareness, right, to the right people. It possibly helps you know, policymakers to really think through the issues. These are the hot items. These are not as hot and maybe, you know, help reach somewhat of a resolution. Despite the fact that obviously through that whole process, people have been maybe hurt. Um, people may be suffering as a result of that. But um, it sounds like maybe that is still, you know, a path to the right direction to get us, you know, where we need to be. Um, and I also like something that was raised earlier uh, where we talked about the young kids, right? So in terms of, you know, lifting that limitation so that it allows them to freely express themselves and also um, build their intellectual capacity, right? Um, you know, questioning the status quo and finding answers, you know, through curiosity, um, being able to speak up. Um, which obviously would help them build courage as young kids, but obviously don't use it in a hurtful manner. So I feel like it's sort of with the kids, it's also finding that right balance um, that allows them to, to grow their intellectual capacity. So I, I think this was touched upon um, the government, right? Um, I believe, Sarah, you mentioned that um, at a point you did make a reference to the government. And the next question here is, should the government, um, and I feel like I sort of know where you guys may lie, but I want to I want to hear your thoughts here. Um, maintain an absolute freedom of expression. Well, I think you know, yeah. you no, know, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Please. No, I mean, I just I think it, to me it's it's pretty simple. I think the answer is yes. Um, and there are going to be certain private restrictions on that, and I think schools have a slightly different. Uh, orientation to that, although Fabrice, I like your sort of solution to that, which is you have the right to say you might not support a particular action, but you don't have a right to say it in a way that hurts somebody else. I mean, you know, and the government does listen, and, and forgive me, because I know this is a sort of stupid hackneyed trope, but you're not allowed to scream fire in a crowded movie theater, right? And there's a reason for that, and that's because it poses, that crosses the boundary from speech into the threat of bodily harm. Um, yeah, I, no, I, I think it's actually, it's, it's actually important that you, that, you, that you make that reminder that you know, if, if you're going to hurt anybody, you right. know, th then, then there is limits. Um, and you know, I, to kind of reiterate the point I made at the beginning, when I, when I see uh, the Singaporean government recently protesting a very benign discussion at the U.S. Embassy on LGBTQ economics, mm -hmm. or I see the Chinese government clamping down on representation of LGBTQ plus people in the media, or Russia with the anti-gay propaganda law. You know, I, my response is yes. It is crucial that the government guarantees uh, free speech. But I also, I also love what Sarah said, which is, you know, no student should be allowed to come in the classroom where uh, Sarah's son is and say, you know, trans people are just crazy people, right? This is harassment. This is creating an hostile environment in which people cannot learn. However, 
in the context of a specific discussion on civil liberty, that mm -hmm. student should be allowed to say, I don't think trans people should uh, participate in, in sport, or I don't think that trans youth uh, should be able to, um, to transition. And then there is a discussion, right? I think we have to guarantee that. Uh, but it's such a fine line to maintain between, a, you know, keeping a safe learning environment and guaranteeing uh, free speech. Uh, but I guess that's the reason why we pay those principles and the reason why we pay our government is because those questions are difficult. Yeah, and, and how, you, okay. how, how do you also feel about it? Because a recent friend we've noticed, for example, recently, I think they had um, someone had tweeted something about the Nigerian government and the Nigerian government recently banned Twitter um, usage in the country, right? And a lot of people are very upset about it because obviously some people go to Twitter as a venting tool to get their opinion out. So how do we feel about, you know, in this case, the government can say, well, I just banned a tech company. I didn't necessarily tell the people not to speak, right? But you're taking away that medium or that safe space for them to be able to have that discussion. How, how do we feel about that? Well, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, Sarah, I, I don't know, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but I, I feel that social media gives a platform to people we don't like. You know, there is a woman uh, two weeks ago that created a, a yellow star in which she wrote not vaccinated. The outcry was tremendous. And, you know, and I was kind of upset. But then I was in my bed and I was thinking, I was thinking, you know, before social media, I would never have known that this, that this woman at this How crazy, crazy she was. <laughs> oh, wow. Instagram, Instagram put it to my house and made me upset. Now, this being said, that's probably an incredible progress. You know, that's probably a great progress that even the most marginalized voice, even the most hateful voice, now have a platform. Uh, and, uh, and, and we just have to accept that there is a dark side to it. So, you know, in my opinion, removing platforms like Twitter or Instagram or, or Facebook because we do not like the fact that it gives everybody a platform is very, very problematic. I agree. I, I also think, I mean, it's interesting because I think people have come to feel that Twitter and Facebook are public spaces. And it's worth remembering that they're not. They're private spaces. And, um, and so, you know, I mean, I, I, I feel, uh, I feel that they've been lazy spaces. Um, they were, in terms of the administration, they were created like a lot of things out of Silicon Valley to kind of see if they would work and as a lark and they've morphed into something giant. But I think if you crack an egg planning to raise a chin and what you end up with is a dinosaur, you have to make sure it doesn't destroy the neighborhood, right? Which is to say, I mean, I, so if, if you're on Twitter and there are 20 people saying they're you, Twitter will respond with skepticism until one of those people gets a check mark by their name, right? Because that check mark says that this person has been verified and they've submitted some documentation, there's been a review process. And we've determined that this is the true person. This is the true Fabrice, this is the true Epic. So we have the mechanism to be able to do that on social media. Now, right now, there's two paradigms when it has to do with the truth. And I, I think we're picking the wrong one, right? The American law paradigm is that somebody is guilty until, is innocent until proven guilty. And the academic paradigm is, I'm going to have suspicion about what you're saying until you can prove that it's true. And right now we're using the criminal justice paradigm when it comes to social media. People assume that what they read is right unless somebody proves that it's not true. And I think we need to lean closer into the academic paradigm, which is assume everything you're reading is questionable nonsense until you have verification, which means I actually think we need to encourage the social media companies to take a bit of a stronger hand and have a review process, which is to say, if I want to make an, asser an assertion, 
I can tweet it and then I can submit it to them and then they can come back with a check mark or not. Now, this is a nightmare to administer, but they're making billions of dollars and they can figure it out. And Elon Musk is a smart guy and they'll, they'll come up with something. But a lot of what's happened, I think, with January 6th, for instance, in the United States, has the seeds in a social media system where people assume they're being told the truth. When, in fact, tremendous amounts of lies are kind of circulating about things. And I don't think the... I don't think the solution to that is to curtail free speech, but I do think that these private sector social media companies have a responsibility when it comes to demonstrably factual or not factual information to weigh in a more responsible way. Right now, all they're really doing is collecting billions of dollars in advertising revenue and watching democracy crumble around them. And I think they can do better. I just, I just do. <laughs> I, I have to say, if it, I have to say that Sarah is so good at telling stories because she I hear, I will always, I will always remember the the example of cracking an egg, hoping to get a chicken, <laughs> and, and get, you get a dinosaur, and that dinosaur should not be allowed to destroy the neighborhood. I think it, it perfectly summarizes uh, your Twitter point. Is the, Twitter is the dinosaur destroying our neighborhood. It really is. No, well, I, and you I make a great point because this took me, This you just took us to that question, which you've already answered, which was, you know, should tech company be carving the rights to um, an individual speech, right? I think what I hear is not necessarily, you're not really carving it, but actually you're doing some somewhat of a fact check-in. But where does fact check-in this where because I feel like it could be a slippery slope between fact checking and now editing speech, right? Which is why I think we need very, very strong. And by the way, these things exist. We just need to import them into this into this world. We need to return to our. We need to remember the definition between a fact and an opinion, right? If I say *Romancing the Stone* is the best movie of the 20th century. Twitter doesn't need to weigh in on that. It's a stupid thing yeah. to say, but it's not, it, but it's an opinion. If I say Helen Hunt starred in Romancing the Stone, Twitter can go, it's FYI, she didn't, right? So if the government says the election was stolen, which has huge implications that is still bringing the U.S. to its knees, somebody can say, factually speaking, that's inaccurate. If somebody says, I hate Joe Biden, you can go ahead and say that because that's free speech and that's your opinion. And I think These things are actually less complicated sometimes than we make them. Fact and opinion, opinions are one thing, but facts, you know, we, we have science and we have academics because certain facts are provable. And yeah, I love that. I, I have to say that this is very smart. And, and in a way, you know, the example I gave about this woman that designed that Star of David saying not vaccinated, well, I have to admit that I'm going to see that in my feed. I'm going to see that in the news, and this is upsetting. But you're right. I should be, I should be uh, protected from lies that that then I cannot really verify myself. And um, so I think you make a, a very balanced uh, and 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 very compelling case for those tech companies to take their responsibility and ensuring that we do not receive lies presented as universal truth. No, that that that's great. And now I'm going to turn to the creative sector, and obviously, I guess on the other side, also capitalism. How do we feel about you know? Do we feel like there's any impact of freedom of speech and expression into in the in, in creativity and innovation? Um, are there instances you've noticed um, where it's either hindered or helped promote that? Well, you know, to get to your point on capitalism, uh, you know, I, f I find myself very often in the middle of a call for boycott, in which because a company like Chick-fil-A or Equinox has expressed something that is problematic, LGBTQ plus people are saying, well, you know, we don't want to work with them anymore. And, and people have pointed at it as the cancel culture, and basically restricting the freedom of speech of companies. My point of view is that as a gay man, I am under no obligation of giving my money to people that are peddling horrendous uh, uh, claims about me, right? 
that my family is less valuable, that I am destroying, you know, tradition and culture, or that I'm a threat for society, right? Once you've done that, you're not going to get my money anymore. And I don't see how this is cancel culture. I don't see how it's restricting free speech. If you are a company and you say, as an example, that you are not going to make cakes for LGBTQ plus people because their marriage, you know, you disagree with their marriage, I don't see why I should continue to give you my money. And in fact, I'm going to tell everybody I know you should not go to the bakery. And, and I don't really understand why people are saying, well, this is cancel culture. You are, you're not letting people express in themselves. I think it's me exercising one of my rights, which is to not spend money with companies that are homophobic and transphobic. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, when it comes to the arts and creativity, I think, um, I think freedom of speech is in some ways, well, no, it's, it's, it's vital as it is anywhere else. Because I think often it's the artists who stand at the fringes first. Um, you know, I think of Pussy Riot and all of the activism that they have been a part of and all the things that they've stirred up. And you know, I think often throughout history, it can be, it can be kind of the outcasts and the misfits and the weirdos who end up in the arts because there isn't another place for us. And so often we're creating work that's deeply threatening to an establishment that, uh, that they really kind of want to silence. And I think there's, I think there's a tremendous amount of value in making sure that artists always have that voice. Um, oh, somebody wants to talk. I didn't know you could do that. Cool. <laughs> Okay, I guess. Um, I don't know how that works. Please. Hi, Michael. I think you can speak. Oh. I guess we lost him. Maybe you type your comment. Um, okay. you, you can type. You can type a comment in. All right. So. It's death by technology. This entire uh -huh. pandemic. Well, we, just, we just want Michael to know that we've not uh, muted his mic, his mic uh -huh. out of, of, of curtailing freedom of speech. Because <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know what he was going to say, so uh, we cannot really be accused of, of, of having muted his mic intentionally. <laughs> I will say, you know, something else that I heard in that podcast the other day that kind of made me laugh, but that's a good point which is that when people have freedom of speech and they let you know who they are. And yes. sometimes it's valuable to know that there's somebody in the room that's not safe for you and somebody in the room who hates you and hates everything you stand for. And I think there can be value in that. And I think if we create a kind of, if we're looking for a mean where everybody's polite and everybody says the right thing, then those issues aren't on the table. No, I agree. I agree. And I, I love what you say, uh, Sarah, because I'm going to tell you something. I am very much in favor of trans people being able, you know, young trans people being able to compete, right? And the reason is because I believe that sport plays such a crucial role in socialization, but yeah. also that sport is such an important part of our society. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't really want to hear the arguments of people that believe trans youth should not uh, be allowed to compete uh, you know, in, uh, in college uh, sports. But the truth is that because of freedom of speech, I, I get to listen and I get to read the argument. And it's good for me. It kind of challenges me a little bit in my strong-held belief of how the world should be. And, uh, you know, my natural tendency is that I don't want to read anything that I find homophobic and transphobic. And, in, and, in, and, and in, in some way, I am grateful that I have to, to receive those arguments and see them in the press and in the media. Now that, that's great. Um, I see someone just joined us, um, but I wanted to throw something out there because we've talked about um, tech companies. But what of companies in general, like, you know, Fortune 500, you know, they are the money bags, right, of most economies. 
what role can they actively play to help drive and encourage freedom of speech in its absolute sense? They have access, right? In terms of these are deep pockets. Most of them, you know, lobby to Congress. Most of them help shape policies. Most of them are sitting on the right tables. Is there a role for them to play to help to continue to promote? Because I mean, um, I hear you, Fabrice, you talk a lot about the, you know, LGBTQ, um, LGBTQ, I'm sorry, LGBTQ communities, right? Well done. How, thank you. <laughs> How do we make sure that we continue to have inclusive conversations to ensure that people aren't feeling marginalized? I, I mean, doesn't that start in the boardroom? I mean, I, I, I think you have to look at who's running your company and they have to, they have to represent women and people of color and the queer communities. You know, I mean, I, I think what I've experienced is when I'm the only woman in a room of men, um, it can be very challenging to speak up because either I'm asked to speak for all women and that's, there's a lot of us that, that takes some time and thinking. Um, or if I say the wrong thing, the eyes get rolled and I get silenced. And so I, th I think the goal is to have these fortune 500 companies run by people who look like everybody and who act like everybody and who love like everybody, because that way, if you have people employed at your company who need to bring an issue of LGBTQIA representation, they know, oh, Fabrice is on the board. I have a voice here. I have somebody to go to where I can be heard. Whereas if they know this is a board of only straight white guys, how safe are they gonna feel in that corporate culture? Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I feel, you know, that, that in many ways it also works on the other side. Now in, in a, in the United States and to some extent in Canada, sometimes employees will have the feeling that they cannot express opinions that are either unpopular or opinions that go against the values of the company. And companies have to understand that they cannot discipline or sack individuals that say things that don't really go, you know, as long as it's not in a public, in a public fora in which they are representing the company. But if it's in an internal discussion and they say something that is against migrants or they say something that is against LGBTQ people or they say something that is, um, that is racist, you know, you can respond to them without giving them a punishment if they have not created an environment that is harassing for others or if, if they have not done it in a threatening manner they should be entitled to express their opinion in the discussion. And sometimes that's a little bit uncomfortable to accept, that we have to agree to leave space for people to express opinions that we find are repulsive. So let's let, thank you so much. That, um, you know, smoothly um, transitions into, let's give Michael the free space <laughs> to now express his opinion. I see he's um, on the stage. Yeah, I, 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 thank you so much. I, I didn't realize that I could actually advance to the stage <laughs> just like that. <laughs> I thought I, I, I was contributing a, a comment, but oh, okay, okay, here I am. Welcome. Um, Welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm involved in um, uh, change processes. I mean, specifically in the communication communication side of change processes. And so I'm very deeply involved in the processes that take place in organizations trying to find their purpose and trying to, you know, focus on, on, on certain aspects. So, um, <clears throat> I'd be really interested to hear um, how how do you go about how can you address these 
barriers between, you know, cultures and 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 genders and 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 so on. And I've I've written a, a great deal about um, gender equality and. It seems to me that it's, it's, it's a big conundrum. It's, I mean, there are many, there are many moving parts to the overall problem, and it is a problem for all stakeholders. It damages gender equality and racial inequality, damage society and business. To an uh, to a, a huge extent, um, it is very difficult to pick it apart. To yeah, and you, you know, Michael, to respond to that question, I think I will I will come back to one of the points that I that I wanted to make at the beginning of the of the panel, which is that sometimes I feel that what we call today a culture war is actually just a process by which as a society we come together with different opinions and we find a consensus. And maybe that expression, culture war, is just a negative way to look at the fact that sometimes the extent of opinion can be, uh, can be painful. Okay, so, um, you mind muting, please? Sorry. I do think there's something I, 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 I hear you Fabrice and I really agree. And, and I think when you're in the process of when you're in the middle of it, it can feel ugly and uncomfortable, but I do think it's also worth noticing that the impact of free speech lands on different people and different groups for different reasons in different ways, which is to say, if you're coming from a group that has always been privileged and protected, right. exercising your free speech can be, do violence to somebody who is uh, who is coming from a group where speech and language has consistently been used to silence and oppress them. And so I, I think it's worth pointing out that while everybody needs, I think, equal access and equal rights to free speech in enacting those rights, I think I, I have been in places where I've heard people say, well, I'm just... You know, this is just my free speech. I'm like, sure, but you're also replicating patterns of oppression by using certain language to identify other people. Um, yeah. I think in, in the culture of a corporation, it's important to have an understanding of that. That if you've got... I, I love that. And I have to tell you, Sarah, you know, one of the holes in my argument, too, is that there has been cases in history where hate speech has led to violence. And to you, jam on the violence. And so, you know, I, you know, I have to be careful not to say, well, you know, every opinion is welcome. Well, you know, if it becomes a little too loud, sometimes it translates into violence. So those are the limits. The um, limits. So we have just a minute left. Um, any closing thoughts? <laughs> this has actually been an incredible conversation, and. Uh, I feel like we, we got a lot out of it, you know, great content, very rich. Do we have any parting words? Well, you know, to me, to me, I'm living with, the, with what Sarah said, which is, you know, if your egg has given birth to a dinosaur <laughs> and the dinosaur is destroying the neighborhood, maybe you have a responsibility to put a leash on your dinosaur. <laughs> I love leash it. Leash dinosaurs. That's, leash my, that's, dinosaurs. Our, that's our takeaway, leash your dinosaurs. Leash the dinosaurs. Love it. Great. Yes. Yes. Sarah, well, the same thing. So and uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. I think, you know, it's very, it's very good for food for, for me, uh, given, given what I work on now. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. You guys have given me a lot to think about. I'm grateful for the time. Thank you so thank much, you everyone. Soon. Have a wonderful day. Ciao, everybody. Bye, Bye. Bye FA. Thank you.